Here we go. Welcome again. This is our intro to I-5 workshop with the focus on sustainability and corporate social responsibility. My name is Amber Camila and I'm the senior research manager um, for the I-5 project. On the Project Zero side of things, we are based at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I'm joined by two um, professors who were part of our expert pedagogy group who helped co-develop the framework. And I'll give them a moment to introduce themselves, starting with you, Jose Luis. Thank you, Amber. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jose Luis Camarena. I'm a professor at uh, the School of Management in Externado University of Colombia. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'll be sharing with you, hopefully, some uh, useful examples on how to implement this very interesting framework. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Luis. Dirk? There you go. Hello, my name is Dirk Mosmeyer. I am German by background, working with Kedge Business School on the Bordeaux campus in France. Um, they're on a um, position in strategy and sustainability. I've been just running away to get this one, which is a research hand or a sage handbook for responsible management, learning, and education that I've been co-editing with with colleagues. Um, so I've done quite some field uh, work in the field, among others, also as associate editor of the Academy of Management Learning and Education. So quite a, quite a number of uh, theoretical perspectives before, before coming to France. I've been teaching in China for eight years with the University of Nottingham there. So I'm also bringing in kind of different perspectives from different cultural backgrounds. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome to you both. And so our time together in the next about 80 minutes or so at this point. We just finished our warm up um, and we'll spend the majority of our time talking through the I-5 framework, discussing the three components, the anchoring assumptions, the methods and the signature moves. And then we'll have a brief moment to cool down just a few minutes at the end to talk about, well, what's next after this? What happens after the workshop? Because the workshop is just the beginning. And going through all of these, a, a through line is that today it's about enjoyment and connection, discussing topics that we care about and connecting with the prime community. So we have a few conversation norms for our time together. This time is intended to be more like a workshop and an, an interactive workshop and not just a webinar. So feel free to jump into the chat and share um, your perspectives or to share your thoughts or raise your hand at any point if you have question or if you wanna contribute in some type of way. We appreciate your expertise that you bring to this conversation as well. And so with that in mind, here are three conversation norms that we like to keep in mind as we um, go through this time today. So one is to remember the holistic. The, the I-5 framework is a holistic framework. All of the elements are interwoven and interdependent. And the way that we will be presenting some of the, the, um, the methods today is in a linear fashion because it is a workshop. Um, but that is not to say that there is a hierarchy of the framework, but that it, they all go together in some way. And if you see connections that we don't name, that is absolutely fine and encouraged because we want you to be able to make your own connections and your perspective is valid. Next is to check your mindset. Notice what's happening as you are introduced to some of these ideas. Activate your curiosity. And what happens a lot of times as we have seen in Project Zero is that when we are doing professional development with educators, there's a tendency to say, oh, that'll work in my classroom or that might not work or this happens or, or, or there's more critique sometimes. And what we encourage you to do is to say, hmm, Act, let me think about how I might adapt what I'm hearing instead of replicating exactly what I'm hearing because all classrooms are different and that's the beauty of it. You are the expert in your classroom, right? And so think about how you might adapt versus replicate. And lastly, prepare to interact. Uh, try to be present to the degree that you can. We know that we're all in different places right now. So try to reduce distractions and con contribute to um, this learning community that we're trying to have for the next 70-ish minutes, 75 minutes or so. And also show respect to others. So those are our three conversation norms. And with that, I wanna keep this thinking routine in mind, connect and extend. So please take out your note-taking devices, whatever you typically use to take notes. This is to activate your own thinking and your own feeling around the ideas that, we're sh that we will be discussing today. And keep these two questions in mind. 
which ideas connect with or reaffirm ideas and experiences you have already had. Why is this important? Because I five, while it, we are giving it, it, it's a new framework, all of the ideas might not be brand new. And most educators do so much um, intuitively already, but there might not be a name for it. So I five is giving you language to describe some of the things that you've already been doing. And so it's important to note those things, which ideas connect with experiences you have already had, things that you're already doing. Similarly, what ideas extend your thinking, giving you a new idea or helping you to see something in a new way? We believe that there will absolutely be something that can be challenging or refreshing or intriguing about the I-5 framework. So also note those things. What connections are you making to things that you've done in the past and what extensions are you making to things that you might be able to do in the future? Connect and extend. Keep these two questions in mind. So why are we here? Let's talk about the vision of I-5. Well, and I'll try to quickly go through this because I really wanna give more time to Jose Luis and Dirk to explain um, how they've been doing I-5 in their classrooms. And so, but I do wanna give a little bit of a setup around why we're even here today. And Jose Luis and Dirk, feel free to chime in at any point about this. So take a moment, we looked into the world and we see that essentially it's a mess out there, right? There's problems, there's natural disasters, there's there's just all kinds of crimes, there's wars, there's a lot going on. And we say, okay, we need people who can handle this, who can approach these issues in a different way. These are wicked problems. These are things that need a different type of skill set. We need business leaders who are equipped with more compassion, who think beyond the, just the bottom line to be able to address these issues. Well, then how do these business leaders learn these holistic skills that are needed? enter the business classroom. We need to do something different in the business classroom then so that we can prepare our students to be these leaders who enter into the world, who know how to lead with compassion, who are working, who are being ethically minded, who are thinking sustainably, who know how to work across cultures and across differences. We got to change the classroom. And that's why we are developing the impactful five pedagogical approach, because we believe that by using this approach, we can begin to develop those responsible leadership competencies, those responsible management competencies that to help our students learn how to be these types of leaders we think the world needs. That's the vision. That's why we're here today. Anything to add, Jose Luis or Dirk? Good, good. All right, let's keep going. So that's the vision. And so enter the I-5 framework. It has three components. The first are the anchoring assumptions. These are the principles that provide the foundation for the I-5 framework. I-5 was developed from a number of different um, literatures. So we have psychology, neuroscience, responsible leadership, um, of course, just uh, leadership education is coming from these different places. So what anchors all of these different ideas together? The anchoring assumption gives you, um, makes it those, those anchors more explicit. And then the methods. These are the broad description of classroom practices that um, are a part of the I-5 framework. We went a little bit more deep. We went a little bit more detailed to say, well, we have the broad description of the methods. Those are what are called the I-5. Let's really see what that looks like in the classroom in a practical way. What are the actions that are part of the methods that we need to pay attention to? These are what we call the signature moves. These are the specific actions that educators take in their classrooms that represent the essence of each of the methods as it relates to responsible management, responsible leadership, and sustainability education. So these are the three framework components you want to remember. Today, we will just be covering at a high level um, the methods and the signature moves. Um, please know that there's a playbook out there that you can reference and that if there's anything that is particularly piques your curiosity, you can go back and read. Yes, Dirk, Dirk has it right there. Um, that you can read the playbook. So pay attention to only what resonates with you the most right now, because it is a the the framework has thirty components, and we're not trying to um, inundate you with too much information. So we we are hitting this at a really high level, and so know that you have the opportunity to go back and and read at your leisure. So here, let's keep going. So first, we're going to go through. Just broadly, what are the I-5 methods? 
the keywords in the shorthand that we use for each method is the word that's capitalized. So the first is make learning meaningful, keyword meaningful, foster joy and well-being, keyword joy, develop supportive social interaction, keyword is social and supportive, I'll tell you more why later, facilitate active engagement, keyword active, design for iteration, iteration, keyword, those are the I-5 methods. And as I said, these are the keywords, meaningful, joy, social, active, iteration. And they each have these signature moves. Like I said, there's plenty here. We're not gonna go through everything, but I just wanted to show you this overview because by the end of our session today, this overview will make a lot more sense and it will be something that you can say, okay, I'm gonna point to that one. And I think I wanna go a little bit deeper in that, but I just wanted to show you this first, all right? So let's get into these anchoring assumptions. And I'm going to go through these briefly. So first thought is that we're trying to change the world here. We need new leadership. We need a new way of thinking about leadership too. So leadership, as we see it, is not just an individual position, but it's a complex process of social influence that shapes the thinking and action of others toward collective goals. What is this saying? We're not just relying on people in in uh, leadership roles, like positions of power, positions of authority to take on leadership, to be leaders. We recognize that at any level within an organization, people have power and that power is important to use. And there is no place where you don't have power. We want to acknowledge all of the power that's there. And so we're saying in any role that anyone has, so not just educators who are teaching leadership, if you're in marketing, if you're in accounting, if you're in finance, there is a leadership role that you can take. And so that's why we think that this is relevant for any discipline within business, because we see leadership as not just this particular position, but it's the, it is an exchange. It's a complex process of the way we all interact with each other. Next, why are we even here? We're here because we believe that attaining the sustainable development goals is vital for long-term business and societal success. This may go without saying, but it's important to make it explicit. This is what we believe. This is why we're here. This is, this is the change that we want to see in the world. We're moving towards this. With that, Responsible leaders and managers demonstrate self-awareness and ethical attention to others and the world. This is just a broad definition of what responsible leadership means. This is really also an invitation for you to define what it means in your own context, because each context is different. What we're saying is, at least at a baseline, we agree that there's self-awareness and ethical attention. That's a part of what it means to be a responsible leader. Next. I-5 is a pedagogical approach. So we have a perspective about education, right? So our perspective is that powerful and lasting learning involves holistic, interdisciplinary, and playful experiences. Let's look at playful for a moment. So the I-5 framework um, has its origins in the pedagogy of play work and that was funded by the Lego Project some while ago. And we wanted to see, okay, do playful learning experiences have a place in the business classroom and if they do what does that what does that look like and and how does that translate and we saw that with the I, with the development of the i5 i5 framework that play is absolutely essential <laughs> um and so the i5 methods are actually um inspired by the playful characteristics that came from the pedagogy of play work um, you will see that a playful experience is so much more than something that would be frivolous or just joyful supposedly or just like it doesn't or or it's too simplistic or silly a playful experience has so much more. It's so much more than that. And so hopefully by the end of this session and also by the end of reading the playbook, you'll see why it's vital to actually have playful experiences in business classrooms. And lastly, um, the I-5 framework is a learner-centered model. And this anchoring assumption is what is pointing to that. So this is to strengthen learning, business educators must shift from common models of just presenting information to designing and facilitating dynamic learning experiences that enable students to construct their own meanings. We're going away from the sage on the stage model. We're going away from just that transmission model of education where there's an expert and then they're saying, hey, take this information and put it into your mind. Because we aren't trying to create 
robots in the future. Although AI, that could be a question, but no, but you see what I mean? We're not trying to create automatons, people who just listen and just do. We want thinkers because those types of thinkers will be the responsible leaders that we need in the future. So that's what this is saying. We, we want to even demonstrate in the classroom that there is an equitable way to the way that we're exchanging knowledge in the in together. So these are the five anchoring assumptions. So now let's get into the I-5 methods. Oh, I went a little too fast. So the first, again, it's not, this is not a sequence, but as we're just talking through it, make learning meaningful. Making learning meaningful is about honoring and emphasizing the existing knowledge and experiences of your students. This is about provoking critical reflection on relevant topics. It's to say, what are the things that set your students' hearts ablaze? What are their passions? What are their interests? How can you begin to bring that into the classroom and make it meaningful for them? Also, what are your interests? What, what do you actually care about? I'm sure all of us have taken courses where we're not too sure that the professors actually enjoyed the content <clears throat> and you can tell, but when, when educators and professors actually enjoy what they're teaching and they're passionate about it, the learning experience changes. And so that actually points us to what our first signature move is called role modeling, is how are you role modeling um, responsible leadership practices in your classroom in ways that students can actually notice and observe. And then personalizing, base word there is personal. That is about how can you make this learning experience more personal to your students? So um, how do you make it so that the, the course is fresh for each student cohort and doesn't and the students don't experience it as an heirloom that is passed down from classroom generation to classroom generation, right? It's to say, how do they see themselves in it? Then surfacing, keyword there is surfacing. It's to say, if we're, if we're trying to develop these leaders in the world who are going to be operating from a holistic place, that's a status quo shifting type of action. And that means they're going to have to be challenging some of the norms that are out there. And if you're challenging norms, that means you need to go deep. You have to go deep into seeing like what is actually happening underneath the surface of most things. What are the histories um, that are happening that that what are the biases that are involved that are embedded in systems and practices? And let's bring those things to the surface so that we can actually challenge and change the status quo so that we can get to those sustainable development goals that we want. So for example, if you think about sweatshop labor, sweatshop labor didn't come out of nowhere. <laughs> it came somewhere. There are beliefs that enable that type of thing to continue to go on. So what are those beliefs and where are they in the system? Let's surface those things. That's what surfacing is about. We're going deep. We're making this learning very meaningful. And then dignifying the root word there is dignify or dignity to say, when we think about the classroom, there are always going to be power dynamics at play. So there will be dominant and non-dominant uh, people coming from different cultures and backgrounds in the classroom. So how are you making sure that you dignify the experiences of the students who are from the non-dominant groups? How are you making sure that they feel that they belong um, so that you're not perpetuating those systems of power that continue to keep us in the chokeholds that we are in today in the world? That's what dignifying is about. So now I'm going to pass it to Jose Luis to share how he's been personalizing in his classroom. Yeah, thank you, Amber. Um, yeah, I forgot to tell you that uh, currently I'm teaching a sustainable development course for third semester business administration students. Um, and this, this idea is very, I just recently finished uh, the first time uh, doing this, which is basically to tell students to uh, establish a personal sustainability challenge. That, and they, they work on this for the whole semester, you know, for maybe five months. And each month or so, they were, uh, you know, showing some kind of evidences that I asked them to. And the, the interesting thing is that they chose what to do, right? Uh, because they, since they are, you know, initiating their college education, they are very used to be told what to do, right? They are very good at, at following orders, so to speak, or very good uh, 
some sometimes. But when you ask them to, you know, to for themselves to, you know, set a goal or set a challenge, something that you are going to be proud of at the end of the semester, they were try they were getting difficulties because they didn't know what to do. They were like, but professor, what do I do? What do you suggest me? I don't know, you figure it out. You come up, come with your own ideas and then we'll discuss it. Okay, so basically I, uh, some of the students, you know, said some, some uh, relatively easy challenges to do. For instance, some of my students were concerned about the high energy consumption in their homes. So they basically, uh, their goal was to lower their energy consumption or the energy bill. And the strategy was to, you know, disconnect the, the electronic devices that were not going to, that are, weren't, weren't going to be used or something like that. Other students went, uh, you know, beyond and did things that I'm very proud of. For instance, in this picture at the right side, you can see some uh, students that were part of a, I don't know what to say, a voluntary volunteer thing that basically was to clean the some streets of the city center, the historical center. Um, this was organized by the local government, you know, the mayor, uh, but my students were engaged in this uh, thing to clean the streets. Other students, uh, the left side, he tried to, uh, in their apartment building, he started to put some um, posters regarding how to correctly separate residues and try to teach um, their his neighbors how to correctly uh, separate um, the, the trash. Other students uh, went to ask their families to gather some unused clothes so they can donate them. Um, and this was very interesting because we saw in the, in the class something like circular economy, uh, the reusing model and so on. So they put that into use with the clothes donation. That was very interesting. Amber, you could please, uh, next one. Next slide. Yeah, other students went on and made like a little documentary about secondhand clothing available in the, in the city and they upload that video to TikTok or whatever other social media, and they, they try to, you know, communicate to, to their friends and, and contacts on the social media about the, exist, the, the stores that sold uh, secondhand clothing. Other uh, students were uh, concerned about water consumption, and they put that uh, bucket in the shower, so, Meanwhile, you you uh, wait for the the water to get cold, hot. Sorry, they save that water to whatever to the toilet. And the other one on the upper right, this was very interesting because this student uh, helped a friend of his to obtain a job in a in an important uh, company. He helped this uh, friend of his that was, you know, um, having a troubles at home. It was a very delicate matter, but he uh, did his best to, he motivated him to get out of that pickle or difficult situation. And then with his help, because he knew people, you know, his, his contacts, he managed to have his friend uh, get a job. And that was an interview he uploaded to YouTube and showed it to me about uh, how proud proud of, uh, of his friend he was and how was the process. It was very, very, very interesting uh, a strategy to use this because the students had the opportunity to set their own personal goals according to what they 
uh, considered important or, or what they needed to do uh, to engage in sustainable development. And I know I have some uh, things to improve because um, some of the students, not everyone had very ambitious goals. Some of the students did the bare minimum, you know, just to comply with the with the task, but some of the students were beyond the expectations and I'm very proud of the results. So this is how I personalized my, my sustainability course. Uh, I, I had very good uh, results, I believe. Thank you for sharing this example. It sounds like it it did really, you know, for some students, it took them to a place, which was wonderful. And then for other students, we can expect that there's that normal distribution of students that, you know, from the high yeah. level, less engaged. And yet you gave them the space to be able to make, to do something that was more meaningful to them, which is very different from assigning, a, it could be different from assigning a case study about someone doing um, a sustainability challenge. They're actually doing it themselves, you know? And so that makes it that a lot more meaningful for them. So I love that you had that experience. Any, does anyone want to share about um, a way that they have made the, the learning in their classroom more meaningful? or personalized in a, in a similar way that Jose Luis did? Just wanna open up the floor. If anyone else has done that or something they'd like to share. Um, I could just share something very quickly in that uh, we are currently working on a transnational project with three different universities from across the world. And this is in the context of um, sustainable finance. And uh, the students in the first part of their um, learning, it's, it's, it, this project essentially is about different pedagogical ways that you could bring the concept across to them. So there is peer teaching, there is, uh, there's peer learning, there's peer teaching, there is um, uh, virtual uh, flipped classrooms and so on and so forth. So there are many different things that we use in this project. And one of the things that the students had to do was to um, take part in something called as a 21 day sustainable challenge, mm -hmm. which meant that every day each student went out there and did something that would contribute towards a much more sustainable future. And then eventually at the end of the 21 day challenge, they, they wrote a very critical report about it. And most of the people have been admitting that it felt very good, but it has also been very difficult. Uh, the process and it's been a very steep learning curve so so yeah that's that's what we had I appreciate that example too because um going what both of you examples both of your examples have in common is that you're making it real for the students so that actually connects to one of the later methods as well which is about make which is about authenticating having authentic experiences um that bring students into a real space because sometimes classrooms, even though we, we can have more fictional um, types of things and imaginary types of things that we want students to think about. But when you make it real, they they can experience the challenges and the benefits and they see it in a different way. Um, and so we talk about sustainability. Um, it sounds nice theoretically, but what does it really mean to live it? And so having students actually live it increases the chances that they might be able to have maybe one day develop policy around it that makes it more practical for people and whatnot. So I appreciate that it's both meaningful and personal to the students and also it becomes real and something that takes them outside of the classroom. So very I-5. <laughs> Let's keep going to the next method. And it starts, I like to start it off with this quote from Paulo Freire. The task of the teacher, who is also a learner, is both joyful and rigorous. It demands seriousness and scientific, physical, emotional, and affective preparation. Next sentence is, a, is a wonderful. We must dare so as never to dichotomize cognition and emotion. I'll read that part again. We must dare so as never to dichotomize cognition and emotion. Why am I pausing here? It's because this is probably one of the, the more challenging um, perspectives to bring to most classrooms in higher education. 
it is saying that we are not just trying to separate the mind and the body and the heart. They all go together. <laughs> Let's not separate them. And that's what foster joy and well-being is about. It's about this holistic perspective to the individual. The students that you are connected with in your classroom, they're not just students, they're whole people. <laughs> they're not just minds to take in information. They are hearts, they are spirits, they are bodies. And we're keeping that in mind, right? So we want to foster joy and well-being. This means fostering holistic wellness by creating joyful experiences and supporting emotional, mental, and spiritual fulfillment. And so I wanna point out, that remember I told you about the playful characteristics that were used to inspire the I-5 framework? Well, one of the playful characteristics was joy. What makes this a little different though, is that we added and well-being because joy is one of the emotions that we all experience. And we know that there are a ton of benefits um, to bringing joyful experiences into the, into the classroom. To make this have an emphasis on responsible management, responsible leadership, it was important for us to add well-being to that because that is to acknowledge the vast range of human emotions and human experiences and making place for them in the classroom. So foster joy and well-being so that we could cover that range of human emotion and the embodied aspect of being a student if there's a physical component. And so here are the, the four signature moves related to foster joy and well-being. Delighting, the root word there is delight. How do you bring delight into the classroom? Whether it's humor, fun, um, whether it's whether it is actually silliness, silliness, whether it's praise or rewards, games. That's what delighting is, because when you take a mundane subject subject and at, make it a game. The learning can improve significantly. There can just be, um, the people can remember it better. It can just be in, in the emotional aspect of it. Um, you can increase it and make it more positive and make it more memorable for the students. So delighting is to say, how would just bring a delight to the classroom? Sensing, the root word there is sense. This is helping your students learn how to sense the emotions of themselves and others and learn how to manage them. This is about emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is an important leadership competency, we all know, um, but, what, but where do people learn emotional intelligence? Students need not wait until after college and they, do, and they go into some executive leadership program where they learn about emotional intelligence. How are you beginning to um, embed aspects of emotional intelligence to your classroom. It could be something even as simple as how you role model handling emotions. So for example, if there's something that has happened in your local uh, community that you know is probably emotionally tense for people, how do you come into the class and acknowledge what's happening around you? You might take a, have a moment to just take a moment of silence. You might give students a moment to you know share kind of how they're feeling. Because one thing that I have learned is that, and I remember, and I, and I love this, and I use this in my personal life, is that you can't end an emotion if you don't start an emotion. And so we know that you, if, if tense things are happening in a classroom or in a university space, and you come into the classroom and no one's acknowledging it, it just stays there. It just hangs there. Um, and so being able to actually learn in that space, being able to, you know, develop new skills or or do critical thinking, that will be a lot harder. But if you at least give space for some of that emotion to be processed, that increases the chance that your the learning experience that you have will be more impactful for your students and more meaningful. So sensing, it's even to say, how are you modeling emotional man management in your classroom? That's what sensing is about. And then contemplating, root word there is contemplate. It is, how are you bringing in con contemplative practices in your classroom? So for example, the benefits of going into nature, uh, music, um, perhaps dance, if people uh, reflection, things like that. How are you bringing that into your classroom and using it to serve some of your learning goals? And then lastly, it's rippling. Ripple is the key word there. This is to say, how do you help your students see their individual impact in the world around them? How are you helping them see the ripple effect of their actions? This actually in a more concrete way relates to systems thinking. Um, so it, remember, we're going for these sustainable development goals. We know that everything is interconnected, right? So how do you help your students see that? 
to see the way the systems connect in the way that what they have what they do affects others. So going back to the examples that we heard from Jose Luis and Laxmi, these students doing these sustainable development challenges, these personal sustainability challenges. I'm sure they were beginning to have to think about what are the rippling behaviors that they engage in because they know that this one action has a ripple effect on the world around them. So those those were actually also good examples of rippling. I'm going to pass it. Um, well, and with that, as you think about contemplative practices, here's an example of just a a model that you might be able to look at, um, the tree of contemplative practices to give you some inspiration, silence, how do you use silence effectively in your classroom? Um, and these slides will be sent to you afterwards. And so you'll be able to have the link there. The other is, uh, you might've already heard about this framework called the inner development goals. This was created by a group who said, hey, we find we feel like there's a gap in the conversation about sustainable development goals. We need to think about what do we need to do internally as people to be able to achieve these goals. And so they uh, developed this uh, companion set of goals that are more so focused on the individual because they recognize how important it is for there to be inner development in order for us to actually go towards the sustainable development that we want to see in the, at a global scale. So that's just another acknowledgement of the importance of uh, this inner work, which is what the method Foster Joy and Wellbeing is trying to get at. I'm going to pass it to Jose Luis again to talk about how he has been bringing more delight into his classroom. Yeah, thank you, Amber. Um, this uh, thing we just came up with, this was just like a month ago. Uh, this was for our seventh uh, semester students in which they conduct like a consulting process in a company about corporate social responsibility. And basically at the very end of the course, the teams uh, present to the company representative the action plans or the proposals they have come up with. So... Normally, we uh, award our students with the digital badges uh, so they can put them on their LinkedIn page or something. But we, this semester, we did something different, and that was to award with like an actual physical medal, little medals. Uh, some of the teams uh, regarding their, you know, their performance on, for instance, so several categories. We had, for instance, the most innovative action plan, the most, uh, you know, down to earth plan or, or executable for the company. Uh, we had another category for using the, the tool, better reuse of the tool and so on. So basically we awarded some of our students and, you know, to, in a hopes of infusing some surprise uh, to, to the students. And we had some very uh, positive feedback from this uh, because they felt that the good work was recognized, you know, not only with the good grades, but something uh, more maybe um, symbolic in a more symbolic way uh, and that's it uh, I believe you know you will see that some of the some strategy that you implement in your classroom is going to be linked to more than one uh, signature move of this model but this is the, the thing because this, this is systemic also you know uh, maybe you have some strategy that it's joyful for the students but it's a also uh, promotes active engagement and it's meaningful also. So I don't know, this is uh, interesting. These medals were very cheap to, to make, like less than US, one US dollar per, per medal. So this was very, very nice. Thank you for that example. And how did you, how do you feel your students responded to receiving the medals? Ah, oh, they were very pleased. Uh, they had, <laughs> They had us to take pictures with them, as you can see, and they uh, immediately put that into their LinkedIn page and they made like a very huge uh, <laughs> a post about how 
proud they are and uh, they spoke very well from us, the professors, and they made us very proud. Mm, excellent. And if anyone else has a, a, a way that they bring just delight into the classroom for their students, thank you for sharing that example. Just want to hear from anyone else who's who's joining us today. Something that you've done, what or whether it's delightful or if it's related to any of the other signature moves, maybe some of the contemplative practices or rippling. Just welcome another voice. Feel free to also drop into the chat. See anyone else? Oh, the name of the tree, it is the Tree of Contemplative Practices. You could go to contemplativemind.org. I'll also drop the link into the chat. And with that, if there are no examples, I will keep, we will keep going. All right. So the next method is called develop supportive social interaction. Every word here in this description is so important is about establishing a community in which students can observe, listen, dialogue, and effectively communicate with others with different perspectives, practices, and cultures. So crucial for the ever globalizing and flattening world that we're in is how to interact with people, um, period, and then how to interact with people who are different from us. So with that, I want to note this this word here is also important. I said that this would that I would note this later. So it's not just develop social interaction because there are all types of interactions that you could create in your classroom between students, but we're saying supportive, <laughs> those interactions that will help students feel safe and also free, um, where they can actually learn together and grow together. So supportive social interactions. And so we have four signature moves again. Communifying, we had to make this word up. It was so important that we emphasize this particular um, action. The root word is community, to say building a community in your classroom, a community of learning where students can uh, learn to trust each other and um, learn how to work together and to collaborate. Because if you're trying to learn challenging things, if you're doing some of that meaningful work, be it doing some of that surfacing, like I talked about before, going deep, you want to be able to do it in a place where you feel comfort, comfort, right? Or a place that feels safe, at least. There's a difference between a safe space and a liberated space. In the playbook, there's a, a brief line about that. If you're interested, I would say, look into that. Um, but it's to say, you, you got to create an environment where students feel like they can actually go there, where they can ask the challenging questions. Speaking of challenging questions, braving is the next uh, signature move. Root word is brave. So we're imagining these responsible leaders in the world, right, who are challenging the status quo, shaking things up, going toward the sustainable development goals. It is no small thing to do that, right, to go against the grain. That's hard more often than not. We need students who are brave. So where do they learn how to be brave? But in our classrooms. Let our classrooms be a space where students can learn how to talk about the difficult topics, how to engage in some of those hard conversations. There was um, another professor who has been attending these I-5 workshops, and when she heard about braving, she decided to do it. And so there was a topic that was really taboo um, for her to talk about in her community. Well, it wasn't so much taboo as it was something that people knew was happening, but no one wanted to talk about. And so she decided to bring it to her classroom um, because the culture in her school, she said, was more hush hush. They they don't they don't talk about things directly. She decides to challenge that norm, which is important if you want to be a leader and you want to actually make some change, right? She decided to challenge that norm in her classroom. And at first, the students they they were like, mm, "We're not sure what is what is going on at the beginning of the at the beginning of the session." 
by the end of the session, the students were just just talkative. They loved it so much. They were so in it. Um, and she could barely get them to be quiet. And it was she felt so encouraged by that because she was nervous at first to talk about that. But what did she just do? She not only practiced braving in her classroom, helping her students um, um, actually brave a topic. She also was role modeling right? What we talked about in the, the method called Make Learning Meaningful. She's role modeling what it means to be a responsible leader. She had to do something um, where it took nerve to do that. And so showing students how to be a responsible leader is, I would say, is much more important and effective than just telling them how to be it. The same thing going back to the personal sustainable challenge, sustainability challenge. Talking about it in theory is is nice, but actually doing it, it's different. And so braving is an example of that. Thinking about how you can brave some of those hard topics in your classroom. And I'll, I'll say this too, high five is a personal work because braving, in order for you to help your students brave, you'll have to brave too in the classroom. And so you also have to recognize, like, how do you go at your own pace? There are There might be topics that you find difficult to talk about. So how do you begin to brave in your personal life so that you can help your students brave as well? Next is another BR word, uh, it's bridging. So bridging is about making bridges between different uh, cultures, people of difference. What's different about bridging um, from exposure, we chose not to use the word exposure because exposure is about, you know, it's, it's, it's attention to something that's different. The exposure is good, yet we're saying bridge. We're saying bridge because we want there to be connections across, not just observations between different groups, but real understanding and real meaning. So going beyond just, you know, perhaps watching a video about a group or about a perspective, Instead, bringing that group in so that you can learn with the group instead of learning about the group. This is important, especially as we think about how we want to upend stereotypes and biases that motivate so many of our actions. And typically those biases are strengthened because we have that separation. We have just that exposure and not that actual bridging that we need between people of difference, okay? So then we have lastly teaming, the root word is team. So helping your students learn how to actually work in teams. Um, and that is different from a group. <laughs> All groups are not teams, right? So there might be group assignments and group work that where people are kind of forced to work together. Yet what does it mean for people to collaborate? When you think of the word team, to collaborate, to communicate, to have norms within, with each other, to talk about how they will um, approach conflict. That's what teaming is, being explicit about the interpersonal skills that you're aiming to develop in your classrooms. Because think about it, of course, in the working world, we're always working with people. Where do you learn how to work with people, <laughs> right? We need, and I'm sure we've all worked with people who, and we might be those people because we've all had these experiences where I'm not sure you know how to work with people or how to work on a team, right? So have your students leave your class knowing how to work with people, how to work with teams, how to be accountable, how to be honest, things like that. So let's go to an example. Jose Luis, back up, back up to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, this is very straightforward, uh, communifying example, which is basically have our students to uh, develop, you know, communities with other uh, students, uh, possible from other um, parts of the world or other cultures, so they can learn uh, how uh, different methods there are to, you know, to things. In this particular case, I, I remember we have these, our MBA students, they meet uh, Professor Mohammed Yunus that visited our campus in, in Bogota. They were very pleased because for them, this was like meeting one of their heroes, right? And by the way, uh, we had some, this kind of uh, network with the Yunus Social Business Center, Bangladesh. So often we had some of their students from the network come to, to us or otherwise we have some other students go visit them uh, 
in order to you know forge this kind of networking um maybe we have some we have done some uh coils you know these uh, collaborative uh, classes uh virtually uh you can pass to the next one amber and normally in march and july uh, each year and sometimes in november we have this uh international uh, programs regarding uh, specific issues within the sustainability realm. So we have some courses regarding circular economy or social business or base of the pyramid uh, courses, short courses like two weeks in which we have uh, students from uh, several parts of the world join to and try to solve a challenge uh, from a Colombian SME. Um, we have uh, received very good uh, feedback from this. The interesting thing is that our students get to know people from other countries. The companies have, you know, um, the feedback or suggestions made from students, master students from other countries. And this is very, uh, Normally we have some interesting uh, suggestions because they help us try to think outside the box, you know, because normally we have some uh, established mental models, but then comes someone from India and they do things differently. And this is very, uh, you know, uh, how's the word? Like, they open your mind to other possibilities, right? So this is very interesting. And I, I know, of course, this is not new. This is not something that I only do that. Of course, there's a lot of professors that do this every every semester or every week. But the, the important thing is that you, as Amber said early, this model helps you to have like a concept behind the empirical work we already we are already doing. So. I don't know if anyone wants to share their own uh, social interaction uh, practices. Anyone else should have any examples of how you might have been brave in your class or some community um, building activities that you use or ways that you help your students work in teams or bridging? Anyone like to share? I love to use silence to invite. <laughs> I don't know how to raise my hand. Sorry, I'm trying to. Feel free to for the... <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I'm Natalia. Nice to meet you. Nice so, uh, so I'm I'm from Canada. So actually, I'm from Brazil, but I teach in Canada at HSC Montreal. Um, so actually, one thing that that like uh, this this um, particular topic, it's kind of reminding me. I had this class on social innovation um, a couple of years ago. And the way that I do it, it's very interactive. So I bring the teams, uh, the, the the topics, and then, you know, I would make things uh, work and together and, and share their perspectives on the issue, you know, and sometimes some of the things, you know, people that work with sustainable development, social innovation, we take for granted. Like we have these key assumptions that, you know, like social innovation is good and, you know, community participation is important. And, you know, like we take for granted all those things. Uh, and I had one student that was actually, I would say, um, I don't know the word for that, but it's like someone that didn't believe any of those things. He was very skeptical. Maybe that's a, a word that I would say to everything that we would say in class, right? So let's say we were like about 30 people in the class. And then he would always have like the opposite vision, the opposite, uh, you know, like, so this person that was always questioning everything and every time and everything that we said, and then all the other students would roll their eyes and, oh my God, here he comes again. Oh my God, here he comes again. And then I was, you know, like this thing about modeling and braving and all these things. So I like in my mind, I said, look, if I roll my eyes 
to this <laughs> student. I will I will lose him, right? Because I, that you know, like that was my honest sort of you know first reaction that I would do, you know, authentic reaction. But then I said no, you know, I'm I'm here in a process where you know if I do that, then he will blind to everything that I will be blind to everything that I say. I will lose the student. Mm-hmm. It it will be forever, you know. And then every time that he would do that, I would kind of, you know, push him to think about his assumptions and why he thought this way and like engaging him in the conversation and not contesting what he was saying, you know, like trying to learn from his different perspective. Right. So I was in that movement, right, of doing that. And then, you know, like, let's say, you know, it was the whole semester this way and every single time was the same thing. And then once I realized that like the other students were starting to do the same thing, right? So they were starting to kind of, you know, understand, okay, so maybe, no, no, come on, stop. You know, you shouldn't say that because if we do that, that's the way that they're going to to behave, right? And then at the end of the semester, what was funny, so he wanted to talk to me and I said, oh my God, (laughs) he will say something very bad (laughs) because I was feeling very bad, like I'm useless, you know, (laughs) he doesn't trust, you know, anything that we're saying, he's contesting, you know, he would say like this was the worst class that he has ever taken. And then actually it was the the opposite. So he told me like it was the first time in his whole, you know, probably it, it was his way of going, you know, about uh, his his classwork and all his coursework. Uh, uh, it was the first time in my whole journey that I felt that I was integrated and uh, I felt respected for having a different opinion because I always feel very judged. And I always feel that, you know, I don't have room in any conversation. It was the very first time that I felt this way. And for me, it was super moving because I was thinking that, you know, like I was doing more for the others, like modeling for the others. And I thought, like, I lost this guy anyway. You know, he doesn't feel anything. And for me, it was super nice, you know, to hear that from him because it was a, a very conscious effort of like not rolling my eyes, like really kind of engaging him. And the and it had effect on him, right? Because then he said, "Okay, it's possible to talk to people that think about me a uh, different different than I do." And 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 then the others the same thing. So uh, I don't know if it calls into the the category and the topic, but I just wanted to share this. this it thing. Ab- it absolutely <laughs> does. Thank you so much for sharing that, Natalia. And I want to just like applaud that. Because what you brought to that student is something that he won't forget. And that was one of the words I said earlier, which is dignity. You brought him dignity in that space. And dignity is a hard thing to recover from when you you feel like it's been taken away. And so you giving him dignity in that classroom was so critical. And the other students, like you said, they saw it. And they saw that it wasn't easy for you, probably. And that's so you're so let me just say you're you touched on so many of the different signature moves. Now there's language for what you did. And I'm just listening and I'm like, you were dignifying, you brought the student dignity, you were personalizing because you were meeting that student. You had to come up with new stuff <laughs> to be able to, to, to meet that student, right? One, you were sensing, sensing, going back to foster joy and well-being, that method. Sensing means you're you're watching the emotions that are happening in the classroom. And so you're having to manage those because you see that there's reaction. And so you're managing those. Not only that, you're managing your own. And so I, I want to just, I want to make that point that as educators, we're human beings. We're human beings too. And we have the right to also experience our emotions. The only way we're going to help our students go beyond some of those quick reactions is to also do that for ourselves. So you're also having to learn on a personal level, how do I manage this? And you rose to the occasion and you were willing to do that. And I'll also say, even if you did have moments where you shrugged him or whatever, you're still human and you could own that later to say, hey, that's not what I was trying to do. And I'm learning how to, you know, appreciate that. So for any of you out there who feel like, hey, I don't know if I can manage that in the moment, moment, or maybe I did have a bad reaction. You can also own that bad reaction because we know that as future leaders, we are bound to make mistakes. We're bound to do things that we are not proud of. We have to be able to own that. That's what it means to be a responsible leadership leader, right? So I love that example. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I applaud you for doing that and doing that challenging work. Thank you, Natalia, for that example. With that, we will keep going. 
And I also just dropped into the chat the tree of contemplative practices that you all asked about. And we will uh, keep going. Love that example. Let's see. Here we go. All right. Let's go to the next method, which is dun, 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 facilitate active engagement. Uh, this is about creating the conditions for students to be motivated to participate and personally invest their energy. Um, so that is to say, I want to make sure that you notice this, creating the conditions. You can't force students to participate, right? You can't force them to be active. And you don't even know if what activity might always look like. For some students, silence is them being engaged, right? For other students, a lot of talking actually might not be real engagement. It might just be reaction, right? So what you're doing as an educator is creating the conditions for students to be able to be motivated. So even going back to what Jose Luis said with his example of the personal sustainability challenge, some students will do the bare minimum. That's the range. We know that. There's the range of the bare minimum to the super, super overachiever getting extra credit, right? That's that's natural. What we're saying with this is you we're we're encouraging you to figure out ways to create the conditions for students to be minds on, hands on, hearts on in your classroom. So first word here is animate. How do you bring life to the classroom? Animating. Next is authenticating. We've been talking about this this whole time, bringing authentic experiences to the classroom, things that are real. Link Linking, this one is about how do you link your students to people who will matter to them in their professional lives. This is about social connections. A little different from social interaction and in that supporting social interaction is more so about creating that classroom community. Linking is about making uh, the relationships that they're building real, that go beyond just that classroom experience and is something that will serve them in their professional lives. That's what linking is. That's what really makes it even more active. And then teching. Teching is another one of the signature moves that we had to make up a word because it was so important and there wasn't a word sufficient enough. Um, and this is about how are you helping your students engage with technology in the classroom and thinking about the types of technology that they will be using in their lives. So big time topic has been AI. What do we do with AI? What do we do with chat GPT? In your classroom, you say, I I do teching. We do teching in my classroom, which is to say, we'll and we're brave. We'll approach any question about technology. We're not afraid of this. We're thinking about it. We're thinking about how to use it. We're thinking about how to not be afraid of it. I'm being mindful of my, of my students' digital well-being. Digital well-being is such an important topic right now. Um, there's actually a new center at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, which I'm a part of, called the Center for Digital Thriving. I would encourage you to look at that work because it is about how are you helping your students manage what it means to live in a tech-filled world. <laughs> There's so many social and emotional things that go along with that. Um, there's questions of digital literacy, media literacy, so many things. So teching is about that. And how are you using technology to actually engage your students in the classroom? Um, so how are you, you might be using Padlet or, or digital whiteboards or things like that or polls to just make the experience more interactive. That's what facilitate, that's what those are about. And we have about 17, 18 minutes left. So I'm going to actually pass by this one, Jose Luis, so that I can make sure that we have enough time for uh, Dirk to uh, share. But could you could you share like 30 seconds of what this is, <laughs> Jose Luis? Yeah, this is basically a company visit. Uh, not the, no more, no less, right? But it is interesting for students to, to have this real experience uh, talk to a, an actual manager and ask them about the challenges they face, how they solve them, and obviously learn how an actual company works. This was a visit uh, for a plastic um, processing company. Mm -hmm. uh, they turn plastic into pellets and they sell it to other companies to further use. So they were very pleased with that. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So example of link linking... Field trips, field trips never get old. I remember loving field trips when I was at, in elementary school and wherever else. Um, this is, wait, let's see. Was this? Uh, uh, this was an example of taking uh, mm -hmm. very quickly because of the, our in our course for the sustainability or CSR consulting, we have this um, 
web uh, application in which students can uh, run the diagnostic uh, for the company. And then this um, platform offers you the results in the form of uh, grid graphs. Oh, so this is basically a, a technology that we developed to to our course of sustainability consulting. Excellent, so, thank you. Yeah. This is interesting. Let's not be afraid of using technology in the classroom to bring more insights into different things. With that, let's go to our last method and we'll finally get to hear more from um, this, this really interesting example that Dirk has to share. Um, so this is a method that I we found that uh, more educators have a challenge with really incorporating. Um, and it's designed for iteration. This is about incorporating cycles of performance and feedback that provide opportunities for risk-taking, experimenting, learning from mistakes, and making changes in thinking and actions. All of those things I just described are absolutely things that people will encounter in the real world, right? So then how do students learn how to take risks, experiment, make mistakes in the classroom? One of the biggest barriers to that is actually grades. <laughs> their students have to oftentimes work for grades or there's standards or there's requirements that um, professors have to have, right? So these are our way of saying, okay, how do we work with the system that we have um, and also still make space for students to do some of this risk-taking and mistake-making and experimenting that is so important for them in their future careers. So first is exploring, that is to say, creating open-ended excitement open-ended assignments for your students um, where they can really have a chance to mess around in something and really kind of engage with their imagination and engage with the content in a new way. Prototyping is about, keyword there is prototype, um, giving your students the space to like create something, get feedback on it, and then recreate, redraft it, get revisions, edit. So giving them the opportunity to go through that cycle because there's so much to learn from feedback and there's so much um, mo so much improvement that can be made when there's a second or third or fourth draft. Giving them the opportunity to actually do that because that oftentimes is what, it, what happens in the quote unquote real world when it comes to product development and things like that. So you're giving them that space to be able to learn how to do that. Um, revisiting. Revisiting is about helping your students learn, uh, um, experience learning as a journey. So learning is not just one destination. It's there. You have it always. But it's to say, how have my ideas changed and evolved over time? This is revisiting. I'm going to revisit where I was before so I can learn from that thing and add that to my experience now, right? So that because there's insights when you can look back right? I can, I can see where I, 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 I was wrong. I can see where my mistake was, and this is how I will improve. So that's what revisiting is about. And then compassing is about that direct challenge to grading. So there's actually a movement called ungrading, um, where it is about decentering decentering grades and summative assessments. Um, because we know that grading is still very much a part of the institutions that we're a part of, and it might take some time to, to break those down. So what can we do in the meantime? The way that you talk about grades, the way that you emphasize grades in the classroom so that students don't focus more on the grades than they do on the learning. So compassing is to say, I'm not so much focused on the grades as I'm showing you the direction that you need to go in. So I'm saying this is like north or east or south or west of the learning goal, but I don't want to prevent you from like really exploring and making those mistakes that you need because you feel like there's this grade that you have to attain, right? That's what compassing is. And so Dirk has an amazing example around uh, compassing and all of these things <laughs> um, that he's going to share. So passing it to you, Dirk. Thank you very much, Amber. Starting with that question, do you brave in the classroom and do we brave enough um, in our institutions as educators, as managers, um, do we encourage our students to think out of the box? Typically we do a lot. My impression is often, but we then punish them for doing out of the box. Um, so I want to encourage you to actually encourage and reward your students for doing out of the box. Um, the example that we're having here um, is a different exam. 
uh, so rethinking assessment, um, starting with or taking the example of an introductory that I have applied in an introductory course on our MSc for Business Transformation for Sustainability. Um, so very much introduction to sustainability, getting people together, understanding where is a shared knowledge and setting the stage for the for the entire MSc program. Um, with two fundamental assumptions. A, with our generation today, the teachers aren't necessarily the ones who are kind of the leaders in sustainability, right? because I usually say I'm born in 1975. That was the last time that the world was in balance in terms of resources used and resources reproduced. So I can claim that my generation offers the solution. I tell my students that they're the generation who has to develop the solutions. Um, second important aspect connected to SDG number 17 is about collaboration and cross-sector partnership as key and really the idea that people need to work together. And so at the end, in the last session of the of the course, we're having an exam and they're only what they know, it's an essay exam um, about the content of the course without much further information. And then they're getting this uh, a one page a piece of paper, physical paper, you see kind of on the right here, the front and the back. Um, and then on the next slide, you see, the overview of what I'm doing, kind of giving the time, we're taking that a bit short. So what you actually have in these, in these um, on the page is three boxes. And the students first are given five minutes to kind of, right, we, we stay on that, we stay on the slide before. Um, right, student one, and student one is asked, write a question in, in box one. Then the students are asked to pass on the page to a, to a second student. Then the second student is asked, answer the question that you find in box one, which so is not the student, uh, the question that the student produced themselves, but which a different student produced for them. Then again, they're passing on the exam paper and a third student is then asked to assess the response in box two as an answer to question one in box one. Um, and then as a fourth step, all three students get together. Um, and kind of discuss both the assessment in terms of qualitative comments and the marks. Uh, so we've got here a live example where we're having the question in box one, then we're having a real answer, and then we're having assessment comments plus one bubble here, right, where the student, where is it there, initially got a 17, and then they agreed, they discussed, and they find that actually the student deserves an 18.5, and they all three sign on it. Um, and then they were invited for an in, um, kind of individual reflection on this exercise in their journals. Um, we can now jump through all the exercises that are in there for all those who are interested. How did you do this? Can you send me the slides or so? I give them the paper and they have the PPTs. You can now flip five slides, Amber, where you have all the questions in original. I said, you get the slides so we can just flip through them and you see them there. Um, Second task, 30 minutes, third task, my fourth task, um, that one. And then on the fifth slide, we see what, what, what did you learn <clears throat> and what did we learn from that? One thing is I've used that in France with my class and the person we see there, Adriana, is a, a different colleague from the um, expert pedagogy group working around the I-5 from Brazil. She used it, so she showed me kind of two weeks ago in a, in a call, look, Dirk, I used your exam. Um, so it's something that can be used in different places. Um, I put the competence framework in there because for me, what I want to very much show to people with that exam, often in our exams, we are very knowledge focused. So very much on cognitive um, um, uh, on cognitive competence, on the independent kind of static knowledge and reproducing knowledge, that exam example that um, Ember mentioned as, as professors, we are much conceptualizing us as the sage on the stage. And we're trying to move through that exercise and the entire course and the way we assess to A, acknowledge that there are different layers of, of the competence, right? so that, that there is kind of cognitive competence, there is behavioral competence that we need to actually enable people to do, they need to do something, and the personal competence, right? Often this, this is discussed as knowledge, skills, attitudes, or head, hands, and heart. And we did a kind of literature review on responsible management, sustainability competences um, that is also kind of linked in at the bottom of the slide and I've just put it in the chat box um, where we find there are actually two dimensions to this. So there's an independent and interdependent dimension. So it's about knowing, thinking, acting, interacting, being, becoming. Um, I used this because I think, or I'm, I'm explaining it here because I use it in a second assessment element, that's a journal. Uh, so one thing is we're having this traditional exam 
and we can show how you can untraditionalize traditional exams to our students and really say, look, this is not about me, this is about you. You're the guys who need to create the solution. You're the guys who need to run the businesses in the future. Um, here in my example, it was an MSc. Adriana did it on a bachelor level, so it works on both levels. Um, the second thing that I'm doing on the assessment level is that they have they're given this this um, competence framework with the six boxes, and then each session, so essentially ideally on a weekly basis, um, they're expected to reflect on their learning. How did they develop competence along this structure, so that they're not just thinking what knowledge did I acquire, but also think. How did I kind of develop action competence? Why did I do something? Um, how did I interact both in my coursework, but perhaps not on action or interaction? Well, I try to do sustainable shopping and say, well, as a consumer, I want to become more sustainable. How does that actually work? And then they can write down these things. And if you have the luxury of having a reasonably small class and some time in between, you could actually even give them feedback. So I've been setting that up um, and sometimes that worked very well that they're writing um, in their journals. And so they can individual, like the individual student and I, two people can read it. Um, and then I was commenting on that and thereby guiding their, their development process. But through this tool, really enabling and giving this message that learning and competence development is about you, right? You're not supposed to reproduce what I'm expecting. You're not supposed to reaching for my expectations, but you're supposed to find your own way of developing solutions that make sense for you as the person who you are with the knowledge, the experiences that you have and so on. Um, so that is kind of the two things, one, the exam, and the second example with the competence framework, a way to use journaling with a specific structure to kind of give knowledge and kind of knowledge um, assessment, knowledge evidencing of knowledge and the documentation of learning. So not knowledge, but much more competence um, back to students. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. Such a such a powerful example. I, I love that because you're I love how you're working in the system. <laughs> you're working in the system to do things that are challenging the system. And I want to come back to that in a moment. Um, but I just wanted to show this 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 overview again so that you see it and you see this is what we we just went through in this the, these last 90 minutes. You learned about making learning meaningful, fostering joy and well-being, social interaction, active engagement. And Dirk's last example of designing for iteration and helping students uh, rethink the way they take assessment. And here are all of the signature moves. And we just want to give you a moment to pause and write down some of those connections and extensions that you've been making to the I-5 framework. I'm just going to give you a moment to just sit with it. Reflection is so important. Then I'm going to come back to Dirk with some questions and we'll just, we'll end on a little bit of discussion. Just give you about 30 seconds to just write some of those things. What have I been doing already? What connections am I making? And what's something that might be interesting to do? What's an extension? 30 seconds. All right, with that, we have reached the close close of our session. Thank you for coming, Flavio. Um, and as we as we end our session, I did want to just ask you, Dirk, how do students, because this is a big question, how do students respond to this exam, the shared exam, the shared experience? They like it. Of course, it's not context-free, right? It comes after having experienced me for at least 18 hours. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> mm -hmm. they know the way I think, or they know exactly that that way that that's um, what I think it was Natalia mentioning that before. Um, this idea of really kind of being open to their views and asking them about what, well, what do you think about it? And well, do we all agree that this is the right answer? And so kind of more working with the opinions that are in the classroom. Um, 
And right, in reality, yes, if we're in social entrepreneurship, we in the classroom all believe it, but there are enough people out there who don't. So having actually a real work uh, voice against that may be very valuable, I think. And it's important to bring that in. So from that perspective, um, the students appreciated it. Um, I think what important is also on average, yes, the mark. So I'm not using that as the only assessment that makes 20% usually out of the entire assessment. Um, the assessment is usually marked a bit better than they would usually be um, if they're assessed by professors. Um, and I'm still I'm keeping them as they are. So I'm not moderating their marks. I think that's important to really send them the message when this is you producing that for you. Um, and um, yeah, from that perspective, I find the, 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 the feedback from the student side very positive. I could imagine that in some cases you might get kind of more pushback from within the institution. And I think that's where the I-5 idea of not just being right, a, a playbook with, with some theories and a lot of beautiful color, um, but actually the community of practice is very important. So mm -hmm. it helped me a lot right, when we had these exchanges on how can you do this and this is a great idea and why don't you do it? But it feels it gives me legitimacy of actually trying it out with mm -hmm. because I said, well, I was always dreaming of doing it. <laughs> and then it was after our August, when was it? August 22? Yes. August last year workshop, um, the first time that I actually did it. Um, and I do think what that that using the I5 network and for all the people who are here get in touch with us, kind of follow some of the workshops, kind of keep up being in touch with people, talk to them about what you want to do and your ideas um, so that you have you feel you've got the support behind you of people who say this is the right thing to do. Um, because often it is, but of course, if you say, well, but how does this work with the external examination in the UK? And how does this fit into an assurance of learning framework of an ASCSB or so? Um, that gives some question marks. And I think having people with around with us and around us who support us is crucial for that one. Oh, that's a great ending note and a perfect transition to the last slides that I'm going to share, which are about what do you do next? It's putting I-5 into practice. So take some time to reflect um, on it. I'm just going to drop in a link to the um, self-assessment that we have related to it because I-5 that we are still very much in the project and we're learning from you and learning from your experiences. We would love if you could take that assessment, read the sections of the playbook and do the exercises. And then in your next course, try something small, try something small, do something you've already done with more intention using that I-5 language or try something new. And as Dirk mentioned, Attend something, a, a, a connection point as a prime member. We have we have been doing I-5 cafes, which were just informal ways of, of um, prime members getting together to talk about I-5. Um, keep uh, Check out the calendar at i5.unprime.org um, to be able to see when the next I-5 cafe will be or just the next workshop to just plug in in the same way that Dirk just mentioned. Connecting with a community of people to help you Think about like, okay, what am I doing? Does this work? Does this make sense? Does, you know, it gives you the strength to be able to, to do some of that braving that you have to do um, as you practice I-5. And so with that, just want to say thank you for joining us today or tonight, wherever you are in the world. Um, and we hope that uh, you let these ideas sink in and that you connect with some people in your local community to be able to walk this I-5 journey together. Thank you all again. Everyone have great holidays. If you're celebrating holidays and happy new year. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.